Hi, this is Pastor Paul, and today I would love to share with you the most important topic in the Bible, and that is, did Jesus rise again? And so today we're going to be looking at the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, because if Jesus Christ is resurrected, then you and I, we have a real hope and a future, because God has promised that because he has resurrected Jesus, he will also resurrect you and I to eternal life. And so we're going to be looking at today the evidence for the historical person of Jesus, his death, burial, and most importantly, his resurrection from the dead. So is the evidence good? Well, I'll let you decide that for yourself towards the end of this program. To begin with, though, we need to ask the question, why is the resurrection of Jesus so very important? And for this, we're going to turn to the letter of the Apostle Paul of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 12 to 20. And the context behind this is that some men have crept into this church and they're beginning to teach the church that the resurrection will not happen, that there is no such thing as a future resurrection. And of course, this has implications not only for the eternal life of the believers in Corinth, but also upon the resurrection of Jesus himself. And so when the Apostle Paul hears this false teaching has crept into this church and is now spreading, Paul confronts it immediately with these words. If it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people to be most pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So here Paul confronts this erroneous uh, doctrine that has crept into this church confronting them on the fact that the resurrection is essential for salvation. Paul teaches that if Christ has not been raised, then we are still in our sins and we have no hope. But the Apostle Paul wants to confirm and affirm that Christ has indeed been risen. In fact, Paul talks in his letters that he actually met the resurrected Christ. And that's what changed him from being a, a Pharisee who was so ardent and dead against the early Christians in the early church and against Jesus himself to suddenly becoming one of the foremost promoters of the Christian faith. It was seeing the physical resurrected Lord Jesus Christ that changed everything. And so underpinning the Christian faith, the very foundation of the Christian faith is that Christ died for our sins, was buried in the tomb and rose bodily or physically on the third day. And then he appeared alive to many hundreds of eyewitnesses. And so this is the cornerstone, the foundation. This is the main bulk of the teaching of the Christian faith, that we are saved not by our own righteous works. We are saved by what Christ did for us on the cross. And it's on the cross that our sin debt was, was paid for. And it's with the resurrection of Jesus that victory was assured for you and for me and for anyone who will trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then that raises the very next question, doesn't it? Did Jesus even exist? Because I don't know about you, but when I discuss the Christian faith with agnostics and atheists, one of the common objections is, hey, we don't even know if Jesus existed. So how can you place your faith in him? Well, for this, I want to turn now to what uh, New Testament historians have to say about Jesus Christ as a historic personage, as an historical person. And I don't just want to quote here from uh, Christian historians, because of course, Christians will have a natural bias towards Christ existing. So we want to look to see what the atheist historians have to say about Jesus. And I'm glad to say both atheist historians 
and believing historians agree upon many of the core fundamental truths of the person or the historical person of Jesus of Nazareth. So let's turn now to a quote from a prominent atheist New Testament scholar called Bart Ehrman. And let's see what Bart Ehrman has to say. Bart Ehrman writes this. Despite the enormous range of opinion, there are several points on which virtually all scholars of antiquity agree. Jesus was a Jewish man, known to be a preacher and a teacher, who was crucified in Jerusalem during the reign of Roman Emperor Tiberius when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. So here we have a atheist New Testament scholar, Bart Ehrman, declaring that virtually all scholars of antiquity agree that Jesus Christ existed. He was a Jewish man. He was a preacher. He was a teacher. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. And, you know, when you get atheist and believing historians agreeing on these points, it's because the evidence is so very strong. And so today, if you were to come across somebody who says, well, we don't even know Jesus existed, write this quote down and share it with them. Because historians are agreed, Jesus of Nazareth existed. He traveled the country of Israel, proclaiming the gospel message, and he died by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate in the first century. So if atheist historians are agreed that Jesus existed, then you and I, we can be absolutely certain, of course, that he existed. Okay. We also have many extra biblical accounts uh, referring to Jesus and referring to the early Christians and the early church. And these are very, very early accounts within the first few hundred years of the Christian faith. So these are very important too. And I'd just like to very quickly uh, reel them off to you. And once again, you can make notes as you're watching this because this information is key today because people want reasons to believe. They want evidence to believe. And so it's very important as Christians that we know how to answer people who have genuine questions. So here are a list of some of the very earliest uh, references to Christ and to the Christian faith. We have Josephus, Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, Julius Africanus, quoting Phallus, the Babylonian Talmud, Lucian, Oregon, quoting Sellus, Galen, Marabar Serapion, the Emperor Hadrian, who is quoted by Eusebius, uh, Philopon, who quotes Flagon, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, uh, the early church fathers, and also we have the Gnostic Gospels. And so when you take this bulk of uh, quotation and literature and you put it all together alongside the letters and the Gospels of the New Testament, you have an absolute massive range of historical documentation for the existence of Jesus of Nazareth and his death, burial and empty tomb, as well as the establishment and foundation and growth of the early church. It really is so exciting to be a Christian because God has given us so much evidence. And that's as a Christian, as a preacher, as an apologist, one thing I love to emphasize is evidence. Because when I read the book of Acts and I see how the apostles and the early church spread the gospel message, they never just said, oh, just believe in Jesus. No, no, no. They gave reasons to believe. They gave evidence to believe, whether it was cosmological evidence. Look at the look at nature and creation and uh, around you and see how God has designed this, the, the teleological argument. They also argued from the Old Testament prophecies, from the Old Testament scriptures, showing that, hey, God foretold the coming of the Messiah, that he would die, be buried and, and raise and raise again. And so they use evidence to confirm the gospel message that they're preaching. And that's one of the reasons why Christianity spread so rapidly throughout the Roman world, because they had reasons to believe. And today, in a society like ours, in a world like ours, that is so very well educated, uh, the people of this world are crying out uh, for reasons to believe in God and reasons to believe in Jesus. So, hey, why don't we give them those very reasons? The next thing we need to ask is, well, how did Jesus die? We know from the gospel accounts and from the New Testament authors that Jesus cried, uh, died in Jerusalem uh, at the hands of Pontius Pilate via crucifixion. 
Okay, that's what the Bible tells us. But do we have extra biblical sources uh, telling us about how Jesus died? Well, once again, yes, we sure do. And so when uh, people who are anti-biased against the church and against the Christian faith are confirming the same details that the Bible and the New Testament gives us, that is very strong, incredibly strong historical evidence for the existence of Christ and the means by which he died. I'm going to give you two uh, very short examples. The first is by a man called Tacitus, and Tacitus writes this. Nero fastened the guilt on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out, not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but then even in Rome. Notice what he says here. Christ existed. There was a class of followers called Christians. Uh, it occurred during the reign of Tiberius, and Christ suffered the extreme penalty at the hands of Pontius Pilate. Also notice where it says that this mischievous superstition broke out. It broke out in Judea, and now he says it spread to Rome. The entire Roman world was now being infected by the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ and had now gone to the capital city of the Roman Empire, Rome itself. So Tacitus confirms the very things that the New Testament authors also uh, confirm. Lucian writes, he writes this, this is Lucian, the Christians worship a man to this day. The distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. It was impressed on them by the original lawgiver that they are all brothers from the moment that they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. Okay, notice what it says here. Christians are worshipping a man. So right from the get-go, the early Christians believed that Jesus was God incarnate. They worshipped the man, Jesus. Secondly, we're told here that he was crucified. He was crucified because he introduced novel rites. He introduced a new system of worshipping God. And that's exactly what we see in the new covenant in the, in the Gospels themselves. Next, it was impressed upon those Christians that they are all brothers once they are converted and they believe in Jesus Christ. Once again, that's confirmed in the gospel accounts of the New Testament letters. So isn't it so exciting that extra biblical sources agree, not only did Christ exist, and that he had a group of followers called Christians who believed they were all brothers, but that Christ was crucified at the hands of Pontius Pilate. Okay, so here we have historical evidence now that not only did Christ exist, but he had a huge group of followers and Christ died by crucifixion at the hands of Pontius Pilate. And even if we didn't have any New Testament documents, we could still arrive at those facts from the extra biblical documents, historical documents that exist and have been handed down to us today. So what exactly then do the New Testament historians agree on concerning the facts of Jesus of Nazareth? And as I share these with you, you might be quite surprised at the facts that the vast majority of New Testament historians agree upon. In fact, when I first discovered these, I was shocked. So I hope you're equally as shocked and surprised as I am. OK, so New Testament historians generally agree on the following facts I'm going to share with you. Fact number one, Jesus existed. Fact number two, Jesus was a Jewish itinerant preacher who traveled the length and breadth of Israel, and he had a large following. He had a large following. Fact number three, Jesus was considered a miracle worker. Now, once again, atheists will not admit that he performed miracles, but they do admit that he was considered a miracle worker. That's very important. Number four, that he died by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. Fact number five, he was buried in the tomb of a rich man who we call Joseph from Arimathea, Joseph of Arimathea, okay? He was buried in the tomb. Number six, 
Fact number six, the tomb was found empty after his interment. The tomb was found empty. And fact number seven, and this is the really surprising one that the majority of historians agree upon. The disciples believed that they had post-mortem appearances of the risen Christ. Now, once again, atheists will not admit that Christ was actually risen, but they will admit that the disciples believed they had post uh, resurrection appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that fascinating that now historians, even atheist historians, agree upon these facts that Christ existed. He was a preacher. He died on the cross. He was buried in the tomb. And on the third day, his tomb was found empty and his disciples truly believed that they were seeing post-mortem appearances of the resurrected Christ. Now, we can put those down to, that, that down to several things. Were they all hallucinating the resurrection? Well, that's a little bit too hard to believe. Well, maybe Christ didn't die and he kind of came down from the cross. Well, once again, if you knew the, the Roman procedure of, of crucifixion and um, the, the means that they went to to make sure that the person on that cross was dead, uh, once again, that's very, very hard to believe. And so we're kind of left with a, a massive group of followers and disciples, um, all experiencing these, these, these visions or these appearances of a resurrected Christ who's not hobbling around in pain uh, or defeated. No, no, he's standing there strong with a, a spear wound through his heart and, and nail marks through his hands and through his, through his feet or heel bones. And th there's no way Unless he was truly resurrected into a glorified body, he could be standing and walking and talking and showing them these marks unless a genuine and true resurrection had occurred. So once again, these are all very, very exciting things. OK, so let's have a look now at some of the facts, the historical facts of the resurrection itself, because once again, the resurrection is the foundation, it's the underpinning, it's the cornerstone of the Christian faith. We are saved not by good works, we're not saved by righteous acts, we're not saved by belonging to a specific church, we're not saved by water baptism, we're not saved by anything else apart from this, that we turn to God with all of our hearts and we trust or we believe in the death of Christ upon the cross his physical burial in the tomb and his physical resurrection, his bodily resurrection on the third day. And when we trust in this and when we believe in this, then and only then can we be saved of our sin and granted that born again experience that guarantees us eternal life with God. So let's have a look at the few facts of the resurrection. Fact number one, Jesus was dead after crucifixion. The Journal of the American Medical Association writes this. Clearly, the weight of evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. Okay, so that's very important. The American Medical Association, they write that. New Testament scholar Gerd Ludman writes this. Historically, it's indisputable that Jesus was dead. Okay, so historical fact number one, Jesus died upon that cross. That's a historical fact. Okay, let's have a look at fact number two. We have very, very early accounts of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, there were many creeds uh, that were passed around uh, just within a few months of the Christian faith getting started. As Gary, Dr. Harry Gabmas, who's one of the foremost experts in the resurrection, uh, shared with me, Paul, as soon as Christianity, Christianity got started, they were proclaiming the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right out of the gate, the resurrection was the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Because once again, there are many agnostics and atheists out there who say that, you know, this 
this idea of a resurrected Messiah came decades or, or centuries after as the myth of Jesus grew and as the story became more and more embellished. So that's where we get this idea of a, a dying, buried and risen uh, God-man came from. And it's simply not true. This can be dated now by historians to within a few months, a few months of the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one of these creeds can be found in the letter of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 8. And once again this creed has been dated to in a few months of the resurrection of Jesus. So I'm going to read this to you right now. Paul writes, Now brothers and sisters I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Now, this is the creed here, right here. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That he appeared to Cephas or Peter. And then he appeared to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to what had normally born. Here is the creed. Paul says he died, he was buried, he rose again and appeared to more than 500 eyewitnesses. And that creed can be dated very, very, very early within the Christian faith, within the first few months, as many New Testament historians will agree. Isn't that exciting? Okay, Christianity, right from the get-go, was all about the cross of Christ, the tomb of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ. And 2,000 years later, we are still preaching that self-same message, and there is power in that message. There is power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fact number three, the tomb of Jesus the tomb of Jesus was empty. Even the opponents of the Christian faith admit that the tomb was empty. Professor of New Testament Studies, Jacob Kremer, uh, writes this. Most scholars by far hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. So Christ died, he was buried, and now historians are agreed that tomb was empty on the third day. Fact number four, women followers first discovered the empty tomb and saw his resurrected body. Now, why is this important? Well, because in the first century in Israel, a woman's testimony was considered worthless. Now, why is that important? Because if you were to fabricate this story, if you were going to make this story up to deceive multitudes of people in the land of Israel, the last people you would have discovering the empty tomb and finding the resurrected Jesus are women. If you were making this story up, you would have a group of men discovering the empty tomb, a group of men discovering the resurrected Jesus. But the New Testament states it wasn't men who found him. It was women. And women were the first New Testament, in a sense, gospel preachers because they had to go back and tell the disciples that he had risen. Now, they wouldn't make this story up if they were trying to deceive multitudes of people. The reason it's written that women discovered the empty tomb is because historically women did discover the empty tomb and historians are agreed upon this. Point number five or fact number five, there were many eyewitnesses to the empty tomb and the resurrection. In fact, there are no fewer than nine historical documents, both inside and outside of the New Testament. Gerd Ludman writes, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus's death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Historically certain that they had experiences of the risen Christ. Wow. Fact number six, the sudden appearance and growth of the church in Jerusalem and out of Judaism. As Paul Alpheus writes, the resurrection proclamation could not have been maintained in Jerusalem for a single day, for a single hour, if the emptiness of the tomb had not been established as a fact for all concerned. I mean, can you imagine preaching that 
the tomb of Christ was empty when all the time the stone was still in front of it and the body was still inside. I mean, people could investigate this for themselves. Jerusalem wasn't very big. There weren't that many rock-cut tombs around. So it was very easy for them to uh, point out where the tomb was and the fact that the, the, the stone had been hurled away and the body was now missing. Okay, so the resurrection of Jesus was quite easy to, to demonstrate in the fact that the tomb was right there. It was a well-known tomb, a tomb of a very wealthy member of the Sanhedrin, and now the body was missing. Okay, so once again, Christianity could have only have launched in Jerusalem within Judaism if that tomb was genuinely empty. Fact number seven, the willingness of the disciples to suffer and die horrifically for the faith without recanting their story. Very, very important. Would you willingly suffer and die for a lie? I wouldn't, but they never recanted and they did die and suffer horrifically for the truth of the resurrection. Fact number eight, there were significant high profile conversions. There were at least two members of the Sanhedrin that converted to Christianity. Nicodemus was one. Joseph from Arimathea was the second, of course, whose tomb Jesus's body was, was laid in. And then we have the the, the anti-Christian uh, Pharisee uh, we call Paul or Saul of Tarsus, who went around imprisoning Christians and celebrating when Christians were being put to death. All of a sudden, he became a staunch believer in Jesus Christ because of resurrection appearances. How else do we account for this? The book of Acts also tells us that many prominent priests became believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And once again, only the resurrection of Christ can account for this. And finally, what was their motivation for making up this story? Just think about that. They didn't get rich from it. They didn't get popular from it. They just received trials and, and temptations and testings and persecutions and very severe treatment. So we have to ask those questions. And so now we are left with three historical facts that must be accounted for. Fact number one, the discovery of the empty tomb. Fact number two, the post-mortem appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ. And fact number three, the disciples' belief in a physical resurrection of Jesus. So which explanation best fits these facts? Well, the best explanation that fits these facts is that Jesus of Nazareth was truly raised from the dead as God promised in the Old Testament scriptures and in the Old Testament prophecies. And I close now with a quote from the New Testament scholar, N.T. Wright, when he rightly says this, that is why as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We have a future hope because God raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. Amen to that. Until next time, may God bless you as you live in that resurrection power of Jesus. God bless.